it's so rewarding to see people share their passions. And it gives me so much hope when there's so much challenge in the world to see these seeds of action. Um, so I, I also, as I turn to introduce Dr. Fernandez Pena, I wanna share a short bit about myself and my connection to Dr. Fernandez Pena, which is that um, my road to public health was, I knew when I was young, I wanted to be in public health, but as I was, it was back in the eighties and nineties when I was coming out as a young little queer and I was going to clubs with my fake ID and smoking cigarettes because that's what we did to feel included. And I was studying uh, queer studies and queer theory and literature and theater and thinking a lot about the HIV AIDS epidemic. I, I, um, that was one of the things that got me passionate about public health, that this seemed to be an area of work where my community was represented and where someone needed to step in and do something because, um, because it was a plague. And so I, um, when I met Dr. Fernandez Pena and found out that he had also come up in the 80s and 90s in the queer community, addressing HIV AIDS from his position. I was so glad that he was here today to tell us about his experiences and about how he sees ways that we can learn from the epidemics that we've experienced in some ways together. Um, Dr. Fernandez Pena is a leader who can lead us in this moment of APHA. And I asked him if he was, had any connection to Minneapolis and to Minnesota. And he did, he said that when he was a young boy in Mexico City, his father worked for American companies and one of his tri first trips was to Minneapolis in 1966. Um, I am not old enough to remember the stadium that is now where the Mall of America is, but it, it sounds like his father may have visited there and he brought Jose Ramon a pennant for his wall in Mexico City that had Minnehaha Falls, Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, and then later his best friend growing up worked for 3M and moved to Maplewood. So he has lots of connections here to Minnesota. And I took a minute on, on our call to, to, to untangle some of the ways that Minnesota is so known for our health and our blue skies and our, our Minnehaha Creek, but that actually even the name Minnehaha is appropriated from a poem. And the creek and the waters and these things that we enjoy, they, are, um, they were here before we came here. And there are, there's ways of unpacking the meaning of all of our places and landmarks. And also in terms of public health, um, this is such a wonderful place to live, but I feel like in public health, we have seen firsthand and early on how great the divide is between, um, between the health that white people enjoy and the health that people of color and American Indians experience. So uh, without further ado, I want to say welcome, and I can't wait to hear from Dr. Fernandez Pena. And um, thank you so much for being in Minnesota today. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm moved by your words. And I have to say that before I go anywhere, my path into where I am today is not linear in any way, shape, or form. I started out in medical school. I always wanted to be a doctor since I, I can remember because I wanted to cure cancer, go figure that. But before that, I wanted to be a stork doctor. In Mexico, it is the stork that brings babies into the world. And that's what I wanted to do before I, have, I had any sense of what that meant. And all that happened and life happened and I did medical school and I finished medical school and I realized that I, I didn't like hospitals I didn't like very much doctors and I didn't like very much uh, the work and the people that had taught me. Many of, of the people that had taught me were actually turned me off from, for example, pursuing a specialty in OBGYN. So I kind of, I've been reinventing myself multiple times for a variety of reasons. And at that point I decided that uh, a good thing I could do was to become uh, an instructor, an educator. So I did a master's program in medical education and I worked at the National University of Mexico training 
students, medical students in a new curriculum, which was problem-based uh, curriculum that was out of hospitals and taught in the community, community setting. So it's truly primary care. And once I was there and I was doing that, I realized that I, it was good, but the policies that created the situations and the availability or lack thereof for, of services and the investments that happened in healthcare were making those decisions without understanding what was happening, really. So I decided to do another program. I did a master's in health policy and management so I could get into that part of the nitty gritty of policy work and administration. And then I got into that and I started working in the, in, but I did my master's in New York at uh, NYU and I ended up working at Bellevue Hospital, which was wonderful in many ways, but it was horrible in many other ways. So also around that time is when I discovered really the pure practice of public health. And I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. And that's where I found my voice and that's where I found my space. And in that journey, I was just very happy a few minutes ago to meet right here my dear colleague, Ella Green Martin, who has been walking a little path with me for the past 16 years, 17 years, since we first met as uh, the liaisons to the caucuses of APHA on the action board. And Ella, correct me if I'm wrong, but I did think that at the time you were the black woman and I was a Latino man. And we would look at each other and say, hmm, we didn't even have to talk. We would just look at each other and raise an eyebrow and we knew exactly what we were talking about, right? And we followed each other and we've been working together all these many years. Eventually, we both ended up on the executive board. And here I am. And here's Ella, currently one of the governing councillors of the Association for the State of Michigan. So, you know, for all of you students, think about where you are today and where you think you're going could change like that. So it's great to be open and to be willing to take chances and opportunities and, and where you're going. So enough reminiscing for that right now. Let me, let me share my screen with you and, uh, and talk a little bit about what I am prepared to talk with you today. And I think I will do it this time correctly. Can you see my screen? I gather that yes, is- Yes, we can. Yes. yes. Oh, great. Thank you. So again, good afternoon and thank you for the invitation to be here. I am going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about what I have learned and what I have, I'm thinking as we're going through the second pandemic of my lifetime. And uh, I come to you from Evanston, Illinois, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge and honor the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Potawatomi, the Odawa, and the Ojibwe, the original people of this land. And though I do not hold a native identity myself, I acknowledge the land to express gratitude for its and appreciation for its first caretakers, and to encourage you all to learn about the long history of this land. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about news from APHA. And uh, some of these things will not surprise you. And I'm sure you know about many of these resources, but just in case. Like most of us, APHA has been working uh, this year on practically everything related to COVID-19 at various levels. As you know, we just had a National Public Health Week and uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity to participate in any of those activities, but I want to thank you for the dedication and your commitment to the public's health. It hasn't been an easy year for any of us on a personal and a professional level, and it's really taken its toll on many, on many levels. So I really sincerely thank you for your continued work in this field. Uh, you know, it's what is it now, 15 months into it, I think we're beginning to see a somewhat bright light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel is still long and fairly dark, especially in certain communities. We have been very engaged in all these things, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see this, the COVID guidance. Uh, we developed a series of uh, resources in English and in Spanish 
in partnership with the Beaumont Foundation and all of those are available on ABHA's website. Uh, part of the, of the materials there are about having conversations around vaccine hesitancy and things like that. We also co-hosted with the National Academy of Medicine these webinars, the COVID-19 conversations. I don't know if anybody had a chance to participate in those, but I am impressed with the caliber of people that came to these uh, 18 webinars, I think. And we started uh, early on with uh, what was the virus and what was the science of social distance. And the last one we had a couple of weeks ago was on uh, virus variants and uh, efficacy of different vaccines. It's going to be interesting to see this in a, a couple of years as a historic document that really takes us from the time when we knew very little until the point where we know as much as we do right now. Another resource that uh, I hope some of you have availed yourselves of already is our uh, webinars on advising racial equity. This builds on a series that we started in 2015, which was entitled then Impact of Racism on the Health and Well-Being on, of the Nation. I encourage you to track those down. They are incredibly powerful and incredibly affirming for those of us that have been doing this work for a long time and for others that are, uh, that are doing this work as well. I also want to highlight that we have been working for a while on policies to work uh, that work to reduce gun violence. And I added the link here so you can check out what we have. I'm not going to go in, into all that today, but I think you know what I'm talking about and how uh, gun violence, among other forms of violence, but specifically gun violence, is a a rampant epidemic in this country that we need to do something about. Gun violence is a public health problem. And uh, I invite you all to avail yourselves of the resources that APHA has put together. Uh, the policy we passed a couple of years ago on, uh, on a number of these areas is, is adds important information to the conversation. We have all been involved also in all sorts of presentations and media. I have been working a lot with the Spanish speaking media and Dr. Benjamin has been testifying before congressional committees and on all other kinds of outlets talking about COVID and racial equity and gun violence and police brutality and these kinds of things. Um, one thing that uh, we have been working on for a number of years is uh, our 2021 advocacy priorities and they're listed here i'm not going to read them for you but uh, this is a kind of work that we do as an association our staff of i think it's two or 1.2 fte's uh, leads this work from from apha headquarters i work through the action board the the group at APHA that leads the efforts to activate the membership into advocacy uh, work. We are the ones that send the annoying emails, if you want, that say, call your congressman. I invite you to reply to those emails, to follow the instructions that come very simply attached in the body of the email, where you just click, you fill out your name, and you can send a letter to your elected officials advocating in favor or not in favor of any policy initiatives that impact the public's health. Another big project that we embarked on at the end of 2019 is the Member Unit Effectiveness and Engagement Project. I assume that uh, Mary or, or Liz, you have been involved perhaps in this, in this work. And the intent is really, or has been, to elicit from the membership of APHA, how is the association meeting your needs as members or not? And what are the areas for improvement? We conducted a number of surveys and focus groups and interviews, and uh, all those have been collated and analyzed. And a couple of weeks ago, the, the group that has been doing this work did a presentation to the, to the executive board of APHA. They produced an interim report and uh, 
we're expecting to start working towards this at, uh, in a couple of months. Certainly, we, as we approach the 150th anniversary of the association in 2022, we understand that the structure that, uh, that built APHA 150 years ago may need to be modernized, may need to be more nimble and more effective and use, make better use of technologies and other approaches so that we are really serving the membership of APHA. Uh, this, of course, will have a, a tremendous impact on the strategic plan of the association, which we started about six years ago, seven years ago, and it's come to the point where we are ready for a new strategic plan that incorporates the findings from this report. There's a website here as well that where you can find the interim reports and the work that has come out of the of this project. I'm about to finish with a commercial break, so please just bear with me for a little bit. Uh, you know uh, that our annual meeting is scheduled in Denver this year from October 24th to the 27th. It will be a hybrid meeting, meaning there will be, we hope there will be uh, an in-person contingent. And there will also be an opportunity to join uh, remotely. Virtual attendees will get a 10% discount for, the, for joining the meeting and uh, CEs will be included in the registration. Additional information about the annual meeting can be found here. And I hope that, uh, that many of you will attend either in person or via, via web. And last in the area of commercials, yes, the 150th anniversary is coming up and it will be observed in Boston in November of 2022. We're planning a number of different things and events to commemorate uh, the, this milestone and uh, more to, to follow, more to be released soon. All right, so now I'm gonna get into my, uh, a part of my story. So, when I look back at the past year and I try to make some sense of where we've been, I can't help but feel like I'm living in a flashback to the mid 80s in New York City as the AIDS epidemic was taking off. I had just arrived in the US and uh, to attend graduate school and I find myself in the epicenter of a killer wave that over the year, over the 10 years that I lived in New York, took hundreds of friends, colleagues, and my partner at the time. I find that there are striking parallels between the two major pandemics of my life, COVID and HIV. So let me take you back to 1981, and some of you may still remember, and some if you don't, you can look this one up. In 1981, there was this note in the MMWR I was also reported on several newspapers around the country about this uh, five young white, previously healthy gay men in Los Angeles that had been diagnosed with this rare cancer and many of whom died very quickly. So as this cluster of cases began to grow, a new disease was uh, identified and unfortunately it was named the gay related immune disorder or GRID. This name alone began to build a sense of general carelessness in the general population and gave permission also to many elected officials, community leaders and other groups to look away and to blame the others and to blame the victims. If it was not happening to us, it was happening to those people. Eventually, it became known as, uh, of course, acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS, and the world quickly learned that no one was immune. But we lost years to inaction and indifference. It took President Reagan years to even say the word AIDS. So this is in 1981. Uh, again, I was just there trying to figure out what was happening in uh, and there was this organization in New York City called Gay Men's Health Crisis. 
as I was, you know, confronted perhaps for the first time in my life with a combination of fear for my own life, with uh, frustration about where to get information, how to understand what was happening, what was real, what wasn't. There was this one organization, GMHC, that was doing uh, exactly the work that I needed. They were collating information, they were producing information, they were sharing it through their own publications. They were doing services to people with AIDS. They were doing health education and prevention programs, and they were doing advocacy work. So I joined GMHC as a volunteer, and I was able to start working with them in uh, developing educational materials in Spanish and training a group of volunteers that we could then go out and do our health education campaigns and our prevention work within the communities that were most affected and not named at the time. We started also doing a program with, uh, with the African-American community through the, the house scene, and we created the House of Latex, for example. And we went to the balls to start working with uh, that community and introducing the basics of HIV prevention to these groups. It was incredibly rewarding work, and it was an outlet for this frustration. It taught me uh, the importance of uh, of public health work at the ground level, at the grassroots level. And it also taught me the importance and the value of advocacy work. Coming from a country and from a place where the concept of advocacy was non-existent, where I never knew who my elected officials were because all the elections were rigged. Coming from a place where you never ever thought or considered the possibility of calling, contacting, or visiting an elected official's office, it was just one of the most powerful experiences I ever went through. I, the first time I went to Congress was in 1990, 1990, I think. And as a board, I became a board member of GMHC and they, I came in, you know, I was a Latino on the board and I could come to, to the nation's capital and walk into the halls of Congress and, not, and think to myself, they're gonna find out that I'm not even a citizen yet and they're gonna kick me out of here. But they didn't. I had a voice and I could exercise it. And that was one of the most empowering experiences I had felt to that point in the middle of this pandemic. So in this vacuum of leadership that ultimately cost 32 million lives around the world and 40 million people who are today living with HIV, there was a way of dealing with a situation and stopping the escalation of the disease. So these lessons, uh, I, I think about them and I've applied them and they've inspired my work throughout the years since then. But let me bring us to today. In 15 months ago, 15, 16 almost, December of 2019. Some of you may remember this, uh, this piece of news that was, uh, this is from the New York Times in March of this year. But uh, suddenly we start hearing reports about this new virus Within a month, the WHO declares a global emer health emergency. And by February of 2020, the first death outside of China is reported. By the end of that month, by the end of the month of February, there were deaths reported in Europe, Latin America, and the United States. And yet the response to this new threat was in so many ways similar to the response to the first reported cases of that other virus 40, 40 years ago. In this country in particular, elected officials from the top down chose, chose to ignore the threat and instead chose again to blame others. It was the China virus. It was something that was being brought by others. We were fine, we were gonna be okay. And chose to turn their back on the communities that were being most severely affected. What we saw last year is in so many ways not too different from what I remember from the 80s. Like with HIV, the urgent need to treat patients consumed all the energy and the resources in the early stages of the pandemic. Prevention was an afterthought. We go to the medicalization of a public health emergency, just like we did in the 80s. There was no talk, like with HIV, 
the federal government showed no interest at all in developing a national prevention strategy and refused to speak about the virulence of this uh, of the coronavirus. They refused to model safer behaviors and not only delayed, but unnecessarily politicized safer choices. Think about condoms and think about masks. Again, like with HIV, the small number of providers at all levels that come from the populations most at risk creates barriers to treatment and reinforces mistrust in services. The need to develop culturally relevant and linguistically appropriate interventions programs was equally hampered, as was the implementation of effective contact tracing programs. The imp this impact was especially severe in the context of mental health services. And like with HIV, uh, the dangers of living in a country where access to health services is most often contingent upon employment is once again exposed in this pandemic. With HIV, homophobia was the main driver in the early days of the AIDS crisis. And today we see perfect examples of the impact of racism in all the structural inequities that feed the spread of COVID-19 across the country. As of today, there have been over 147 million cases of COVID-19 in the world, and over 3 million have died. In the US alone, we have had over 32 million cases and about 570,000 deaths. And like with HIV some years ago, I can personally count over 20 cases and five deaths in my immediate circle of family and friends. So what are the learnings here, I wonder, or I ask myself rather. I think that uh, the first order of business is uh, that in order to plan coordinated responses at the national and local level, there needs to be a well-funded, fully staffed units that can effectively lead coordinated responses from the availability of PPE and syringes to the logistics involved in the mobilization of people and equipment. The matter of, uh, of an inappropriate, or not inappropriate, the matter of workforce in the terms of, despite many efforts at many levels, the health and public health workforce continue to suffer from a tragic lack of diversity. And this in turn remains a barrier to accessing direct services and to the development of culturally relevant and linguistically effective prevention strategies. The workforce is not only does not look or sound like the population it serves, the workforce is, I'm referring to the health workforce, continues to be disproportionately allocated between urban and rural areas or within native uh, communities or within uh, suburban areas. And I, I kind of smile to myself because I keep having flashbacks to some press conferences in the last year that just made my skin crawl. So the imperative to produce and share the evidence, the evidence to support policy decision making is, I cannot underscore that enough. Data collection and dissemination through non-traditional outlets needs to remain an important part of our work. For years, I was on the Community Advisory Board of the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies in San Francisco. And when researchers were coming to the advisory board to seek uh, comment or input from us, we asked the, the question, so what? And it was, if the, your goal was to publish an article in a, in, a, in a journal, that's great. And who will care? What difference will it make? And moreover, how will you disseminate your findings through non-traditional venues so that the community that you've studied gets this information and can benefit from the knowledge you have acquired? So I think it's a really important part of our work. And of course, uh, the critical role of leadership and the need to speak with one voice was made abundantly clear uh, over the last year. With, in the absence of leadership or, or, or ability to communicate with one voice a message, 
really hampers the ability to respond to a threat like COVID-19 or like HIV or like any other COVID that, uh, that may come into the future. In addition, I think uh, the quest for health equity and social justice remains, I think, the common thread between this and other pandemics. We have not made changes deep enough to give us different outcomes in terms of health outcomes. We continue to have problems with access. We continue to have problems with employment. We continue to have problems with housing. We continue to have problems with policies and practices that create the haves and the have nots. In the absence of deeply rooted changes, we will see this kind of, of destruction again. So this is where we need to focus a lot of our efforts, I think, in the coming times. So uh, for example, uh, I want to think that when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, the, the word of the day these days, hesitancy alone does not begin to explain the reasons why people are not getting vaccinated. I mean, how many times have you heard that somebody could not get vaccinated because they couldn't find a babysitter or because they could not miss a day at work or because they didn't understand what was happening? So the importance of uh, going down the road and going behind the questions and understanding where the problem is coming from will be a much more effective way of, of leading our way into trying to achieve health equity and social justice. It's an important and essential work if we're really to find, to be able to make some changes going forward. And on a, not, I mean, I'm sure you probably saw this uh, image a few weeks ago when this huge tanker blocked the Suez Canal. And there's some people still who think that if we make personal different choices, we're gonna change the outcomes in terms of health and we're gonna be all happier if they only understood why it's important to get the vaccine. When in fact, the structural problem is a hundred million times larger than the changes people could make in, in personal decisions. So my bottom line message and what I would like to convey to all of you is the importance of continuing to, to look behind the curtain. It is not the face of the problem that is the root of the problem. And if we're not willing to take those risks, I know you are, because if not, you would not be working in public health. We will not be able to change the outcome. That is, you know, the definition of, of, uh, of madness. And... Uh, I want to bring your attention, and I appreciate Elisa's comments at the beginning of this uh, session. I want to bring your attention to HR 1280, the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act of 2021. George Floyd's death last May at the hands of police generated outrage across the country and across the world. That senseless act of violence reignited the movements rightfully demanding the end of racial profiling, police violence, and structural racism. In March of this year, Congress passed this bill, H.R. 1280, the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. This bill addresses a wide range of policies and issues regarding policing practices and law enforcement accountability. It increases accountability for law enforcement misconduct, restricts the use of certain policing practices, enhances transparency and data collection, and establishes best practices for training requirements. It is now in the Senate. We're waiting for them to act. Police violence is a public health issue. I invite you to call your elected officials. I invite you to talk to your friends, colleagues, to, and invite them to talk to their elected officials and to find out why it is imperative that we pass HR 1280. And with that, uh, I want to thank you again for the invitation to speak with you today. I think we have some time for Q&A. I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Mr. Ramon. Um, we do have a couple questions off the bat for you, and I will start with this one. How can APHA support collaborations with other countries 
and with the WHO in addressing COVID-19 and other worldwide public health priorities. How can APHA, it was a multi-parter and was. I, How can APHA support collaboration, but especially international collaboration? So APHA supports international collaboration through a number of, of uh, partnerships with other areas of the country, for example, the country but with other areas of the world. Uh, Dr. Benjamin represents the association at a number of international forums. We, we can share ideas with other organizations. We of course do not have any kind of legislative power or anything like that. We can be conveners and we are conveners of events. We publish the best known journal of public health that has international exposure. We have a number of members from many countries in the association. We have an international health section where members from not only the US, but also many countries find and meet and talk about things that may be relevant for them in their countries. Thank you. Part two of that was something else, right? Well, it was specific to addressing WHO, uh, working with the WHO and addressing COVID and other worldwide health priorities. And I think in describing the ways that we can convene and communicate and demonstrate thought leadership, you, you offered some possibilities. Do you, I, am, I have another question, so I'm, that's why I'm jumping. So if, if, you, if you think of something else, you can come back to it or someone can put something in the chat. We're using the chat to track the questions. Um, the next one is, when we finally get to the other side of this pandemic, what do you think the top three critical public health issues facing the country will be? <sighs> they had time to think of their questions beforehand. You haven't had time. <laughs> I really believe that identifying, naming, and acting uh, with full intention in redressing uh, racial and structural inequities is going to be what should be taking a lot of our work going forward. Because from communicable diseases to heart disease and cancer and other kind of, of, uh, of conditions, the linkages to structural inequities is clear and well demonstrated and documented. So I think that that has to be our work has to be centered around that work. I mean, if you talk about environmental health and environmental justice, it's another example. The environment we, is something, of course, that we need to be talking about and working towards making important changes in terms of policy and, and how do we get clean our uh, green energy and all these kinds of things. But there's a structural racist construct behind it as well that enables certain sectors and sec certain areas. I mean, I'm looking at Ella again. If we talk about water in Flint, Michigan, you can't think that it happened just because it happened. I mean, talk about an example, a perfect example of structural inequities. If you talk about the, you know, the uh, refineries in the Bay Area or in other parts of the country and the connection with asthma and other kind of conditions, you cannot detach the one from the other. So I think that a lot of our work in public health is gonna be in that space. I think we need to continue to work very much in the realm of education and in the realm of education in, in working with the country, with the population in understanding their health, in understanding and being, a, when feasible, playing an active role. Not necessarily, I don't, I like the concept of empowered patient, but I don't want to talk about patients. I want to talk about empowered citizens that can advocate for their own health and that can advocate for equitable distribution of resources or that can advocate for uh, you know, housing issues or transportation issues or other kinds of broad issues that impact their health. And part of our job is we are health educators at the end of the day and health educator is not going around with my, you know, my little pad and a pencil saying, this is the virus and this is what happens is 
how can we work with what you have so that you, when possible, try to prevent uh, acquiring anything, but you can work actively towards, uh, towards uh, reducing the chances of exposure or reducing the, the structural elements that make you more vulnerable to a certain condition. We were talking, Elizabeth, Mary and I, about the notion uh, that we talk a lot about resiliency. And I, I hesitate to use the term resiliency. I don't want to build resilient communities. I want, to be, I want to build communities that don't need to be resilient to overcome structural oppression. So it's like, oh, oh, oppression is terrible. Let me make you resilient. Bye-bye, have a good life. I'm done with that. I've, I've taught you how to endure the evil. That, what kind of half-assed work is that? Excuse my language. Thank so, you. Okay. No, um, it's beautiful. I, I want to key off of your idea of empowered citizens and of activated citizens and, and activated um, all of us who are members of this public health professional community feeling activated. That is, that is something that I share as a vision for how MPHA can, um, can move forward into the future because we've done it before with tobacco and we've done it with, before with other topics. Um, the question I got here is how can students and young professionals gain experience meeting with their elected leaders? So if you are a student in the field of public health, I would urge you that you become student members of APHA. The Student Assembly of the American Public Health Association, I am sure you have something equivalent at MPHA. So through these platforms is where you really have tremendous opportunity to meet with people, to talk with people, to learn from people, to teach other people, to find peer mentors and, and discover the journeys of public health and how in so many different places you can make an impact and you can start your path towards, towards change. I mean, you are, those, this sounds corny, but literally you are the future. I mean, look at me, I'm older than dirt and uh, I'm not gonna be around doing this work forever. I do believe in retirement and not doing anything, but it's on you. I mean, I want you to be excited about this. I want to nourish and support you and, and to the best of my abilities, guide you and share with you what I've learned so that you don't make the same mistakes I've made, that you make different mistakes and you learn from those mistakes and then you pass it, you, you know, pay it forward. This is how, how this works, folks. This is how we, if I don't help you, who's going to be helping the next generation help sounds a little too condescending but you know what i'm trying to say if i don't work with you to share with you what i know what's the point thank you so much jose ramon i have so appreciated your words and we have generated there are there are other there's questions there's interest there's applause there's thank you for your vision um, I'm not going to be able to get to additional questions because I know that we have, we, we scheduled very short breakout sessions, but I just want to give camp counselor a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Take care.